Hello, good morning everyone. Um, hopefully you can see me. Uh, so I'm, my name's Rory Martin, I'm the Director of Farm Operations and Innovations here at Mice College. Um, I'm pleased to say I've got uh, Sally Ann Emmers from AgriLoyd, which is a company we've worked with in the past um, doing R&D work. So I'm just going to run through uh, a presentation of MySco, who we are, uh, what we do, what technology, what agri-tech technology we've got, and uh, opportunities for collaboration and research. And then I'll hand over to Sally Ann and let her give you a brief overview of some of the work we've done with AgriLoyd in the past. Um, and then we'll have about 10 or 15 minutes for questions at the end of the presentation. So hopefully the technology will work and I can share my screen. Uh, there we are. So hopefully you can all see that. Uh, if there's any issues, just put it in the in the chat. I'm sure uh, we, can, we can get it sorted out. So uh, can't seem to move my slides on. There we are. Uh, so yeah, like I say, um, I'll just give you a brief intro into MySco, uh, where we are and what we do, uh, a bit about the dairy, the food farming innovation and technology centre that we have here on site, um, some future developments we're, we're just on with at the moment, a brief overview of some farm research that we do with uh, a comment from Shepherd Agri, which is another SME in Lancashire that we've worked with before, uh, Sally Ann's presentation and then some questions at the end. So. Myerson College, um, we are a land-based college and university centre in Northwest near Preston. Uh, we have approximately 5,000 students through each year. Now that's, that covers everything from 14 to 16 year olds right up to uh, PhD supervision. Uh, we work in, we're an associate school of University of Central Lancashire in Preston. So all of our degree courses, masters, PhD supervision is all accredited by UPLAN and we, we do a lot of short courses, a lot of apprenticeships and so the core of our business is, is FE. Uh, now we are, we're a land-based college so we're predominantly, we started off as agriculture, we were a, a cheese and dairy makers way back when. Uh, the college has actually celebrated its 125th year last year in 2019 and uh, it, we were going to culminate with uh, some celebrations over the summer this year in our open day, but obviously the current situation all that's been cancelled. But we're, we're hoping to do it again next year. But we cover everything from agriculture, equine, animal studies to uh, sports turf. We have a lot of sport academies, cricket, football, um, that sort of thing. So that's where we are. We're just north of Preston. Um, <coughs> excuse me. We're quite we're reasonably central for the county, and we we tend to we have another that's our main campus with another campus over at uh, Croxteth uh, in Liverpool, and then we have a site at um, Old Trafford, which is cricket and football academies, and a couple of smaller sites that are satellite sites for the the two main campuses. Uh, we tend predominantly to have students from Lancashire, but we do have a national apprenticeships um, cohort and. We, we are starting to draw more students in from Cumbria and the surrounding counties. So, talk about the farm. Um, you can see on the left the, the Google Maps image. The um, the main camp, the farm, main farm is right next to the main campus. Um, so, historically, we are three farms. We have a Lee farm, a Lodge farm which are the two historic stock farms. Lee Farm is the sheep and beef and Lodge is the dairy. And then we have the, the ground, but not the buildings of Light Ash Farm, um, which was historically arable. Now, uh, I've been here for about 12 months now. I'm very much trying to integrate the three farms into one and run it as, as one system. And we're starting to explore things like regenerative agriculture, mixed farming practices, moving the crop and rotations around um, and we're trying to get more involved in research moving forward for the ELM testing trials and um, just innovations into the agriculture community to help us address the climate emergency that we all know is happening. Um, so more or less, if you overlay our farm map over the top of that Google Maps image, that is the, the farm and estate, the, the sort of Myersco College symbol on the farm map 
roughly sits over the top of where the main campus is. Um, so I just thought I'd put that up there to give you an overview of the type of land we've got. It's We are predominantly grasslands, um, although we do run about 100 acres of, of various cropping. Um, we're sort of good quality, grade two, three land. Um, they do tell me in the past they used to grow potatoes here, but it's, it's not something I would try and do now. Um, don't think the yields would compete. So yeah, we're about an 800 acre, 300 hectare platform. We run a commercial herd of 200 dairy cows. Uh, we finish around 300 beef animals a year, predominantly uh, beef from the dairy herd, but we do also have 75 suckler cattle. Um, so we finish our own suckler beef as well. And then we run approximately 1500 sheep to the top. Um, and we have 100 acres of arable, like I say, comprising mainly wheat for whole crop for the dairy cows. Uh, barley, which we crimp, use the straw ourselves and put the crimp barley into finishing rations. And then we've various forage crops. Um, we've obviously a lot of grass for silage, but then we do grow uh, stubble turnips and sort of red kale hybrids for finishing store lambs and, and grazing sheep over the winter. So we're kind of diverse uh, farming operation, which really helps us doing research work. It lets us um, look at different innovations in a range of different uh, farming enterprises. And we, it, it's, quite, it's quite representative of a lot of the farming that goes on around Lancashire. So it's, it's good for our students and it, it's good for prospective companies uh, bringing research in. So uh, a little bit about the dairy now, and hopefully again, if the technology works, we'll have a, a short video here that I'll then talk over the top of. Um, so if you bear with me for a moment. If you just uh, stop share, that would yeah. be great. All right. There we are. So this is our lodge farm site. This is the sort of main farm campus. Um, so this is the dairy unit. It's a, it, unlike quite a lot of agriculture, it's, it's nothing new and fancy. This is a 1980s shed that was put up. And like I said before, we do run as a commercial farming unit. Um, the idea being that it, it allows us to show students the working realities of the farm. Um, I have a commercial target for the farm each year that is uh, research and everything feeds into that budget, but the, the bread and butter of it is a commercial working farm that um, you'll see us in our working clothes here. We, we milk twice a day um, through a 2040 parlour. Um, one of the, the recent investments into it uh, about three years ago as part of the wider uh, FIT project, the Food Farming Innovation and Technology was uh, the installation of a, an Afi milk system. So it's an Israeli company um, that have milking software all over the world. So you'll see uh, the, the units here, the, the blue units of the, the Afi milk, Afi lab. So that allows us every cow at every milking, we analyze uh, fat, protein, lactose content, um, working towards ureas and somatic cell counts. Um, and it just gives us a wealth of data on every animal at every milking. It's tied into tags on the cow's legs, which do heat detection, rumination, um, with outer parlor feeders working, um, feeding to yields. And uh, yeah, that's that's the video finished. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, so we're, we're feeding through the outer parlor feeders. Every cow's treated as an individual. Um, and it, as I say, it gives us uh, a wealth of information to use for that research piece and the the way the shed is set up you can uh you can see on that picture on screen now we have the the shed is split into four quarters so we have around 55 beds in each quarter of the shed and a bank of two outer parlor feeders in each section now each outer parlor feeder has uh two solid feed options and the liquid feed option. So it allows us to split the herd down into different treatment groups. We could have three treatment groups in a control being fed 
up to two different hard feeds uh, and a liquid feed. So it gives us a massive amount of flexibility within feeding trials and dairy evaluations. Um, and it's, it's just a fantastic bit of kit to get research data. Students love it. We can give them, uh, we've had it in three and a half years now, so we can give them three and a half years of historic data to wade through and, and get lost in. Um, so, there we are. That's, uh, that's just a, a brief picture of one of the cows, the information from one of the cows over the last 10 days. So you'll see you've got uh, the two milking yields, uh, daily average yield, conductivity of the milk, um, which is an early warning indicator for mastitis. Uh, you've got heat detection, uh, which is taken from the activity. We have a, a weigh bridge that cows walk over every milking, so we get weight information from cows. Um, then you've got feeds, allocation and consumptions, so we can measure um, how much cows are eating, whether, you know, making sure that the diet's working properly. And then you've got your fats, proteins, lactose. Um, yeah, so just a massive amount of data that we still don't quite know what to do with everything yet, but it's, it's grand to have it. It's, we're just looking into a, a, a big data project in conjunction with uh, one of the data science labs at UCLan and just trying to overlay different pieces of data. Um, from all the different data caps we've got on farm and start building a, a more rich picture of uh, what we can what we can infer from our data and, and use it as a, as a management tool. Um, so again, the, the FIT project, Food Farming uh, Innovation and Technology Centre. So we've just another a brief video here to show you. I will stop sharing them. So while this video loads, the, um, the FIT project started uh, in 2015, I believe, they this, this started the, um, the concept for this. You, you can play that, Dan. Um, and it, I think you know, everything was finished and built by 20, uh, 2017. So this is the, the main building, the FIT building, we call it. Uh, so there's, there's lab space in there. There's, um, there's an NIR machine, there's various conference centers, teaching resources. We're, we're using this building predominantly for teaching HE students, but it is open um, to the public for, for conferences and things. Uh, this was then the other uh, building, the development project. This is a livestock innovation center. So this is, uh, we'll have a walk through the, uh, but yeah. So it's straw bedded courts either side um, with a, a cracking film down on the the, uh, the feed face here, which if you think how rough concrete is and, and cows licking, that's, uh, it, I can't remember the exact figures, I'm afraid I should have checked before we started, but it increased intakes massively. Um, so we'll speak a bit more about the grosse feeders in a moment, but you'll see them here in the video. Um, it's, this allows us to get individual feed intakes from cattle uh, via the EID tags and we then have a, a fully EID automated uh, weighing system with, so we can get feed intakes correlated to growth rates and do feed efficiency and genetic evaluation trials. Um, it's a brilliant bit kit, um, allows us to do, we've had a lot of students doing project work through this and we've had work with the likes of Dugdale Nutrition doing feed evaluation. Um, it's just some shots of the yards um, here to try and give you a bit of an idea of um, the farm yard and, and what we're about. Um, you can stop that video there, Dan. Thank you. Let's get my slides back up again, sorry. So yeah, the, the grow safe have been a, a massive advantage to us um, in gathering more data for, for feed evaluations, like I say. And that livestock building is quite difficult to show you everything that goes on in there because the, there's lots of uh, small innovations in it that um, it, you know, it really needs to get people on site and, and show people around and um, sort of government restrictions allowing. I'm quite happy for uh, taking tours around, showing people what, what we're about, where we are and what we can do. But there's uh, that building's got quite a nice 
uh, ventilation system so it has a little weather station on the side of it and it automatically adjusts the size of the building to take account of temperature and humidity and, and keep the perfect environment for cattle inside there so again that's another aspect that we haven't fully utilized yet is the, the weather data coming from that system um, and we have, we have cameras set up throughout the shed we have microphones so we can look at different weather conditions on animal behavior we've done some work before on finishing cattle where we evaluated cattle in the, the same end pen of the shed um, but just on opposite sides of the build, opposite sides of the central passage, if you will. And because of the way the wind blows around, the way the ventilation worked, one side actually performed better than the other, um, which designers and builders of that shed were fascinated by because they could, from all their previous models, it, the, every penny in the shed should have been equal. And uh, they, they were then delving into the data, trying to work out why this was different. Um, so there we are so this is some some more information about feeding and uh, there's just a little screenshot there of the, the growth safe program and what it shows us so basically it's it's weighing each of those bunks uh constantly and it's accurate down to micrograms uh so we can we can tell when we've had a group of students come through and they've lent against the bins because it spikes up or even to the point of we can tell when we've had a bird land on the bunker and then fly away again. So basically how it works is there's an EID reader, excuse me, there's an EID reader in the top of the bunk. Uh, only one animal can put his head in at a time. Every animal on farm is uh, EID tagged with an RFID tag, um, which allows us to individually record them. We know the weight when it first put its head in, we know the weight when it takes its head away. So uh, that then starts to give us intakes, as I say, um, and then we can, use that with the weight gain data we've got to do feed evaluations um, it's quite a, an interesting bit of kit it lets you there's, there's far more within the background of it that we don't do at the moment in terms of genetic evaluations and it's something we're moving further forward with in a partnership with uh, genus which we're just getting off the ground now uh, and then on the right hand side of the screen you've got we run a, a keenan pace system which measures everything that goes in and out of the feeder wagon. So while you've, you can only measure the exact intakes per animal on the grow safe throughout the rest of the shed and even on the dairy unit, we can measure, we know the number of animals that we're feeding for, we know the ration per head and what we've put into the wagon and that'll then tell us if they're eating more or less than what we've rationed them and, and start to give us more, a, a bigger breakdown of the data. It, it tells, it, measures my uh, tractor driver when he's feeding in terms of percentage under or overloaded on each ingredient. So gives us a physical record of what we're feeding each day and how consistent we were, which allows you to section the variability variable, variability out of a, any trials that we're doing. Um, so again, an, another important piece of kit just to, to add to the data collection. You'll see my sort of ethos on farm is if we can if we can gather as much information about what we're doing as possible we might not be using it right at this moment but we've got it there as a bank of data and if if for some reason we decide we need to go back and look at it it's it's there and it's all recorded and it's built into our data system so if someone comes along and wants to do a, a comparison trial a, a before and after of what we're doing currently to then a, a new piece of information we've got that wealth of control data there already um so a little bit about future developments uh you will have seen there was a building site just off the end of our livestock building in that video so we're just in the process of building a new calf unit here um so on the plans on the left hand side you'll see that's the existing livestock innovation building um with the handling system sticking off into the, the north profile so to the west of that is where our new calf unit is going so we're taking on the ideas of the home and lao igloo and veranda system um, which is a more bespoke calf housing system than just putting them into uh, multi-purpose pitch roof sheds which you never get the correct airflow and ventilation in so 
Um, we've done a lot of research on this and, and this is where this is the system we think will get the best performance out of our calves. In terms of data and agri-tech innovations um, and potential future collaborations, we are installing an automated milk feeder with uh, a weigh station at each feeder, uh, which will give us then, well, it, it, it fills in the missing piece of the puzzle, as far as I'm concerned, with data capture on farm. So we'll have a wealth of information about the mother in the dairy herd uh, around calving, and then we'll have information on the calf right through milk feeding, growth rates, feed intakes. Uh, we can program different feed curves into it. We can feed different milk concentrations or even milk powders to different pens of calves. Uh, we'll have that information right through then weights and growth rates, intake data, right through from a calf on milk through to a finished animal or a dairy heifer calving into the herd and going back into the, the milking system. So, it, like I say, it fills in the mis missing piece of the puzzle for a full lifetime data collection on these animals at our farm. Um, and we are, we've a, we've a couple of projects in mind for things to do here and with a lot of dissertation students that would like to utilise this, but we are looking for um, sort of commercial research to do through this unit. So if, if anyone's interested or they know anyone that might be interested, I'm more than willing to discuss uh, opportunities. So just a brief piece about ongoing farm research, um, what we're doing at the minute, you've got just a sort of a, a flash overview of a few of the businesses that we've, we've worked with previously or are working with currently. Um, we've some project work going on at the minute on greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we've a, a system called a flux tower in one of the fields at the moment, which measures background carbon inflows and outflows, um, water penetration, and all that is just collecting background data at the moment, which is then uh, feeding into the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, which is then feeding into government policy around alternate farming methods, uh, the, the carbon cost of farming. Um, as I said, we've done a lot of growth rate work uh, using the growth safes with, with a project with Dugdale Nutrition. We're, we're now doing some work with Dunbeer on uh, whole supply chain finishing methods and uh, different feeding methods, different killing methods, different consumer uh, attitudes to ethics of the different systems. Uh, it's got a financial element in it. It's got the production element in it. It's, it's utilising a lot of the data capture that we do on farm. It's, it's quite a nice project. Um, and as I say, we're always on the lookout for commercial partnerships. We're actually fortunate enough to have just become an AHDB strategic dairy farm. Uh, we have our online launch in November, I believe. Uh, we're still finalising some of the details, but that will be advertised widely and that will hopefully give you a chance to, if you're interested, log in and have a bit more of a virtual walk around the farm and what we're about. And in, in conjunction with AHDV, we're working on evaluating and, and putting forward different best practice methodologies as part of that wider strategic farming group. So it's, uh, it's quite exciting moving forward, really. Uh, so just a brief comment from uh, one of our previous partners, Shepherd Agri, who is, is one of the companies we're hoping to look at some, some calf trials with when we get up off the ground at the end of this month. So uh, we'll, we'll quote here from Graham Shepherd, who's the CEO. Um, so it's greatly benefited their business data obtained from cooperation with Myasco College. They did conduct two trials with us, uh, one on sheep health, it was uh, foot bathing, and one on energy provision to dairy cows, which was uh, Shepherd Agri were the ones that installed our odds pile of feeders. So it was evaluating the improvement to milk yield and, and feed efficiency through utilising those feeders and the, the glycol liquid feed that we, that we were using. Um, so yeah, you can see there, they attained some valuable data from us and helped to develop their, their products and their marketing. Um, and then I'll hand you over to Sally Ann now, and she's going to run through some of the things that AgriLoyd have, have worked with us in the past and how it's been beneficial to their business. And uh, then we'll just have some questions at the end. So I'll stop sharing, Sally, and then you can uh, put your slides up. I think you're on mute, Sally Ann.
Okay. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Sorry about that. I um, again technology. Um, so um, good morning, everybody. So my name's Sally Ann Emmers. Um, so I head up the R&D department um, for Agriloid. So what I'm going to do this morning is just briefly sort of give you an overview of the company um, and really sort of what our focus is. And then I'll um, talk you through a project that we have done in collaboration with Myasco. And then really sort of some of the benefits that we've found, as I say, from a company perspective um, from that study and also working with Myasco a bit more broadly as well. So I'll just share my presentation. Okay. Um, so, again, I'm just struggling to move my slides. There we go. Okay. Um, so, for those of you who are not aware, then really Agriloid as a company, we're really focused on, as I say, sort of optimal animal health for ruminant animals. And as such, we've got a range of nutritional supplements and feedstuff that really compensate for naturally occurring imbalances found in many forage diets. And basically what our products do, they help to correct these imbalances, which obviously maintain optimal animal health and therefore productivity of the animals. What's really, really important to us as a company is that really our products are based on evidence. So really having strong scientific basis for the products. Um, and as such, basically what we've done is sort of have extensive trial work to really support our products. And obviously working with colleges and universities such as Myasco really enable us to have this type of data and scientific backing for our products, which as I say, as a company is really, really important for us. Another aspect that we do with Agriloid is um, to have a forage service. So how this actually works is our Agriloid agents go out to farm and they collect samples of forages and grasses, so grass, maize, whole crop. And basically these samples are then brought into our labs and we perform in-house analysis. So we do dietary analysis of the samples that come in and also mineral analysis. So we have NIR and ICP um, OES uh, capabilities on site. And basically what that allows us to do is to build up a picture of the um, composition of the forage and the feed that the animals are actually getting. So they we can then have that discussion with the farmer about, as I say, optimally um, optimizing the animal health and the products that might help support that. The other thing that we do as a company is we have rumen and flock assessments. So again, that's when our agents go on to farm and really look at the sort of the health status of the animals. And again, this is all really around sort of optimizing animal health and performance. The forage service that we have um, is associated and is a member of the Forage Analytical Assurance Group. So this is an accredited testing uh, group that really sort of allows us to provide high quality and really standardized analysis of, of forage um, content. This is really important. So again, if as a farmer, you're getting sort of solid and reliable data. What we want to do again, as I say, all the way through the business, but um, also with the forage service is to sort of increase the offering that we have and the scientific knowledge that we have. And this is again, where sort of working with academic groups can really help us. And this leads on to the project, as I say, that we've um, carried out with Myersco. I think it was a couple of years now. It was really around the forage service and as I say, increasing our understanding. So um, basically, this was a, a research project um, that, as I say, we ran with Myasco and it was a, a fourth year student that was involved with the project and doing the work. Um, and basically what we wanted to try and do was to understand um, sort of nutrition a, a little bit better in some animals. So as part of our roommate audits, sometimes um, our sales agents would find what was um, undigestible masses within the manure of some animals. Um, looking through the literature, 
again, this phenomenon has been seen before. Um, and basically, I think it was the University of Florida um, described these masses as, as clay balls, which is why that's sort of the um, running title of the project. Um, and really what we wanted to understand was, you know, why were these masses occurring and, you know, what was the reason for them? So really trying to understand, I suppose, two aspects. So what did the masses compose of? And then was there really a link with sort of animal health um, with the sort of the incidence of the masses? So what we did, we collected um, a number of um, samples. So this was through our forage analysis service, but also there was work that was done on farm at Myersco collecting, as I say, manure samples from different animals. And then basically what we did, um, we tested for oil, protein, fiber, ash, sugar, and starch. And with some samples, we also did some mineral analysis as well. So all this work was done by the students, so done by Sophie. So she was responsible once the samples arrived for sort of processing the samples and either carrying out the analysis in-house or, or having that work outsourced. The other part that we did, which is a really sort of nice add on to the study, was also to sort of utilize the um, obviously the facilities at Myersco. Um, and Rory's already talked about the AFI milk system. Um, through that, basically, what we could do was sort of track, as you said, individual cows and take samples from cows, see if there was any masses, so the incident and the size of the masses from these cows within their manure. Um, and then, as I say, analyze that those samples and then try and trace that back and see if there was any um, relationship between, as I say, the number of size of masses with sort of the, the different sort of health status or milk yields of, of those animals. So basically what the study found was that um, the masses were really sort of high in protein. So they were really linked to protein digestion rather than I think sort of initially the um, sort of hypothesis or the thoughts were that it was actually through the cows injecting, ingesting soil. So as I say, it didn't seem to be that, it seemed to do with actually what they were ingesting from a, a ration perspective. Looking at then sort of, you know, was there any sort of um, relationship between sort of health status and the number of masses? Again, we sort of got some sort of, um, I suppose, sort of tenuative links there, but nothing too definitive in all honesty. Um, it looked from the data that we found that the masses were associated with things like sort of um, feed intake rates, rumination time and feed efficiency, rather than sort of any sort of um, different sort of metabolic um, incidences or disorders that might have been happening in the cows. But I think in all honesty, it was a reasonably small sample size and sort of, um, as with a lot of sort of initial research studies, I think obviously further work would be needed um, into sort of really understanding sort of the, the causal relationships with the presence of these masses. So as you can sort of see from the presentation, um, what we sort of could do from the work, which was really obviously great, was actually the work was published. Um, so it was actually given as a poster presentation at Total Dairy in 2018. Um, so it was really great to, as I say, sort of have information that, um, you know, really helped us to understand what was going on and sort of relay that information back to our customers, um, but also sort of increase sort of the scientific um, understanding generally in this area as well. So really sort of that's covered in sort of my, my first point for the, the benefits of the project. Um, so as I say, around sort of that fundamental understanding with regard to the publication, obviously that's a, that's a great thing to be able to do, not only as I say, from the science side of things, but also from increasing the company profile and also the profile of the, of the college as well. From my perspective, what it allowed me to do was to actually sort of provide a, a development opportunity for more junior colleagues. Um, so it was actually our, our forage um, analyst that sort of was responsible for, for managing the student and working with Myersco directly. So this sort of gave him an opportunity to be able to, as I say, um, sort of be responsible for a research project. And as I say, also thinking about sort of the publication of that work as well. So I say a great opportunity for him. And as I say, really, really nice for us to be able to, to do that. 
Um, and as I say, really sort of the other thing from the project perspective is really sort of building the relationship with Myasco for subsequent project work. Um, we have worked with Myasco, I think, probably for about the last five or six years on different projects. Um, as I say, this probably has been the most research focused one of them. Um, but as I say, it worked really well. And as I say, sort of um, we're sort of thinking about sort of, as I say, new trial work and, and new research projects as sort of it fits with our project portfolio as well. So hopefully that's given you, as I say, a really sort of quick snapshot into, as I say, how working with Myasco has been beneficial for us. Um, so I'll hand this back over to Rory. And as I say, we can open up the forum for any questions anybody might have. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Sally Ann. Um, so we've got around 15, 20 minutes now for uh, questions, if there are any. I have seen one that popped up. So are we running courses for agroecology? Uh, yes and no. So it's, it's not a specific topic area at the moment with its own built-in course but it is something that it's built in as a foundation for a lot of our courses and has been for a lot of years so the the bsc agriculture students take a lot of shared modules with the uh the ecology and conservation management students and the, the sort the the theory behind that is that those those two aspects of agriculture can be seen as quite adversarial and it, it can be seen from the farming point of view as all oh, these ecologists that are coming along and telling us we can't do this we can't do that they're a big pain in the bum and the ecology students tend to or ecologists in general tend to say that you know farmers they don't care about the environment they don't want to do anything to help us and actually when you get the, the two of them in a room together and on field trips together and things like that they they can they start to understand the different viewpoints of things and you know the ecologists start to understand that the farmers do care about the land and they do notice a lot of nature they do know what is going on on their farms and and conserve the land that they've got there's just a lot of financial pressures behind them and, and the farming students the ag students begin to understand that there's a lot more they can do on farm to help uh, the ecology of it and the and sort of the environmental factors of it without hampering the bottom line and it, it just builds that collaboration and, and moves it forward then uh, into industry. Now, I'm getting more heavily involved into, uh, like I said before, quite heavily involved in, in trying to influence ELM policy and we're getting involved in some of the tests and trials. We're part of a group working with our vets, trying to look at regenerative agriculture and how we can build it in. We we supply the co-op with the dairy herds um, and we, we We've got the head of agriculture from the co-op coming along alongside our vets at some point to discuss the estate and what we can possibly do from a, an environmental and sustainability point of view and, and try and very much work with the co-op to help show how they're working with the supply chain to improve things. Do some re research from our end into, like I say, using the flux tower into different farming methods and the, the carbon costs of that to try and feed that into government um, and, and try and get more of a holistic approach that in, that that brings agriculture and um, sustainability together and recognises the complexity of the issue rather than just going out and you know all farmers need to carte blanche reduce emissions by X percent because I, I think you'd lose some of the the complexity and the, the richness of that picture if you do something like that and it, it should be an individual individualized approach with common goals if you will um so that's what we're we're hoping to try and leverage some research into government um it's, it's one of my pet it's one of my bugbears that uh, the answer being peddled to agriculture is the moment is that you, know, you can get into the carbon economy and offset for other businesses and i think it's uh sainsbury's have just bought the the carbon offset for their supply chain from uh one of the estates up in cumbria and i'm not entirely certain that we've got the carbon assessment right in farming to know whether we're carbon negative ourselves 
before we start offsetting other businesses. So that's one of the areas of, of focus for me. Um, do so, Hannah Wright. Do we still have horticultural operations and trials, and are we involved in any companies on product development in that sector? Yes, we do still have a large horticultural um, sector of the college. We're not. It's not necessarily. Or it isn't as operational as what the the farm is as commercial, um, but we do have quite a large uh, glasshouse area on campus that there are a lot of trials ongoing in there. They tend to be more uh, more of a, a pure scientific approach rather than in conjunction with commercial companies like we do down on the farm, purely because it's they're more of a research scale glasshouse rather than a commercial scale glasshouse. Um, it's not actually my area of responsibility, but I do talk to uh, Andy that he looks after them. And moving forward, it's it's becoming one of our targets to become more integrated into that um, into that sector and start to get more links with commercial companies and do the uh, sort of lab based plot scale work at Myasco and then push it forward onto commercial partners units um, and get involved with the R&D of those companies, but it's not something that we've, we've built up yet. Um, okay, yeah, Northern Real Farming Conference. Thanks, Melanie. Yeah, I'll have a look at that. Um, so I don't know if there are any other, any other questions. Um, um, thank you. Thanks, Bob. Can I uh, fire a question over, perhaps to, to both of you, really, Sally and, and uh, Rory? Um, the event is Lancashire Innovation Festival, and clearly there's just some, some real strong evidence of quality innovation and research taking place, uh, both in the corporate sector with your work, Sally Ann, and, and, and at the uh, at Myers School with, with yourself, Rory. How how good do you think the um, ecosystem, I suppose, in Lancashire for innovation around agriculture and farming, how, how strong are we? And where, where, where do the opportunities lie, do you think, um, for future, to, to build our kind of uh, capability um, around research innovation as a, as a county going forward? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start on that if you like. So I, I think as a county, we've got a fantastic resource within agriculture because we're quite a, a varied and diverse county in terms of you, you can be up on the hills doing the upland farming and then come across and down towards the sort of Ormskirt region and you're into the veg production and everything in between. We're, we at Myersco are sat smack bang in the, uh, the dairy plane, so a lot of our focus is on dairy, but we do try and reflect that with the beef and sheep and the cropping elements as well. But I, I think we've got all the pieces of the puzzle in the county, and we're doing some fantastic research already commercially and, as you say, in the, the education sector with ourselves. And, and we have good links within education to Lancaster University, UCLAN with, with links into Cumbria and things like that. But I think we're just not doing enough of it, if you will, and we're not being as joined up as we, we could be. Um, I mean, it's one of my ambitions to try and host more collaborative research between sort of Blue Sky University thinking and your, your commercial companies and try and get a bit more of that pipeline coming through and try and almost work as a, a hub and spoke model where you've got the, the hub of Myersco sort of coordinate, coordinating everything and you've got your different spokes of like we just said with Glasshouse Research, um, you know, you, you can have some of the, the, the pure researchers that, that come up with perhaps new technologies or new plant biology um, recognitions of, of what's going on. That then feeds through into sort of plot scale work at, at Myersco which then feeds through into a commercial company. And I just think as a county, we just need to be a bit more joined up in what we're doing, keeping that pipeline moving rather than, and, and being active about how we do that rather than just letting it generate organically, which I think takes a lot of time and you end up losing a bit of that, uh, that speed and that immediacy of the research by the time 
I mean, historically, by the time it filtered through the university sectors into the commercial worlds, you were three years behind. And that's why a lot of commercial companies now have their own R&D departments with their own researchers and they kind of do it all in-house. Um, but I, I think if we can be more collaborative about it, we'll see see greater results. I don't know what Sally Ann's view on that is. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I head up a commercial R&D team. <laughs> so we do have our own capabilities, obviously. Um, but there's only so much we can do in-house. And I think that's where, obviously, we look for that, you know, collaboration and, and outsourcing with other partners. Um, I was just, when you were talking, Rory, I was just trying to sort of think of, you know, sort of who in the agricultural sector that we're, we're partnering with, with different collaborations. Um, and probably there's, you know, in total, and again, and again I'm not going to name names for, for company reasons, but um, there's probably, you know, over the past sort of two years, for example, we've probably had large collaborations with four different academic um, centres within the UK in the agricultural area. So quite a lot and quite a lot of investment, I think, from our perspective. And obviously, you know, some of those um, research projects have been successful and, and some haven't because that's the nature of R&D. Um, which we all accept. So, I mean, how, from my perspective, I mean, when we're choosing who we want to work with, as you say, it's really around, I suppose, it's, it's capability um, and sort of, you know, where the key opinion leaders are as well, if I'm being very honest. So I agree. I think, you know, I think as a somebody in a company located in this area, you know, we really feel strongly and passionately about working with local um, academics or the local companies. We really want to sort of foster that environment. Um, being very honest, you know, logistically, it's much obviously easier if we're running a, a study with you, you know, with Myasco than we are if it's somewhere in the south of England. You know, it, it, there's a lot of, you know, it is a collaboration there's a lot of you know my team might be on site you know again when Sophie was doing her project she was based um, with us because that's where a lot of the analysis was happening so you know having that locality is, is really really you know helpful in all honesty to get a better collaboration and a better outcome um, but I agree I think it's around it's around raising reputation it's around raising people's awareness of capabilities what's going on and I think it's all those type of things that as you say there's some great work and great sort of you know facilities available it's just sometimes people are just not aware of them thank you so yeah I'm not sure if anyone else has got any questions but uh, that's that's been fantastic from my point of view it's great to get out and about and share what we do especially in the, the current circumstances and you know thank you very much to Lancashire Innovation Festival for the, the invitation um, hopefully we can do a lot more of these things moving forward and try and push brand Lancashire because like we've just said I think it's a, a fantastic place to to live and work and we've got all the, the pieces of the puzzle to to push agri-innovation and, and be a leading voice for change. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Rory, and, and thank you, uh, Sally Ann, for joining us. And, and for those of you that have tuned in, uh, it's much appreciated. And, and really interesting to see such a high level of research taking place and, and some really excellent facilities for uh, organisations to, to plug into. Um, and just to let everybody know, we've got plenty more to come uh, later on today. We have. Um, innovation for a, a green recovery so i know one or two of you may be interested in that uh, you can find out more about what that all the talks and seminars and, and presentations at lancashire innovation uh, in the meantime i'll bring it to a close thanks